Where's it go? Awesome. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, so my name's Omar. I'm a customer engineer from Google Cloud in London. Uh, and my talk today is around, you know, how do you go from nothing to doing machine learning on Google Cloud Platform? So I'm not assuming any previous knowledge of machine learning or using Google Cloud. Let's assume that you're new and I'll take you through the different uh, offerings that we have and hopefully there's some interesting takeaway. Um, obviously, um, you know, toward the end I'll stay around. If you guys want to hang around and you have questions, and be happy to answer them as well. So, what is machine learning for the uninitiated? So, think about, you know, actually let's take it a, bit, a step back then. Um, so machine learning is essentially, um, if, if artificial intelligence is a science of doing smart things, then machine learning is the enabler. It's those statistical models that have been around for a long time that actually enable those smart behaviors. It's only now um, in this modern age that we have cloud computing and we have the capacity to store lots of data that we can actually take advantage of these algorithms. So machine learning works essentially by training by example. So if I compare it to classical programming, where I have to predefine explicitly what the solution will look like. Maybe I'm defining a program uh, to identify spam in email. I have to say, if it contains this, if it contains that, before I actually deploy that. The big difference between traditional programming and machine learning is that uh, I'm maybe if I'm trying to classify spam, I'm training a model with examples of emails that contain spam and those that don't, and then trying to classify new examples of data and improve the accuracy over time. So it's learning by example. That's a crucial difference uh, between traditional programming and really defines what machine learning is, much in the same way that humans learn how to you know, speak a language or recognize things. So think about some more generic tasks. So how do we get from an input to a prediction? Um, take, for example, image classification, which is quite a common machine learning problem. So we know that this object is a cat. <laughs> this animal is a cat, and it's something that we know to be true. Um, but often, you know, we might have training examples of cats and dogs, but often we want a more customized task for our specific data set. So we know this is a cat, but actually um, I know that this is my cat and her name is Chloe. So these are common machine learning problems that we want to do. One, we want to identify fundamentally what something is, and then we have more specific problems that we want to solve for uh, more, more explicit models. Uh, another example is natural language processing. So take a, a tweet here. So just based on heuristics, things that I know to be true, I know that when I say remember is a verb or video pair is a noun, and we can see that, you know, I'm talking about something as a pronoun. But what if I wanted to figure out, you know, that actually what is the context of this tweet? Not just its structure, but actually it's talking about programming in, in the context of Google Cloud. So how do we how do we do these sort of things on, on Google Cloud? These are the kind of examples, kind of a running theme that we'll work with. So when I think about the machine learning offerings on Google Cloud Platform, I think of it as a kind of a spectrum of offerings uh, where we have things, um, maybe tools that application developers just want to consume machine learning. We have the building blocks. These are kind of our machine learning APIs like vision, natural language, and so on. Then on the other end of the spectrum, I've got my more expert users that want to build custom models, but I'm maybe a data scientist or an analyst, and I don't want to waste time spinning up infrastructure, I want to spend more time training my model, getting insight from it. We also have offerings in that space as well. So from the novice to the expert, um, as is machine learning APIs, things like CloudML Engine, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then in the middle, we have an offering called Cloud Automa, which is something new, which is that kind of ability to build a custom model, but without having to write the code. So think of these as a sort of core offering in the spectrum, depending on where you guys are in your journey for machine learning. So let's talk about the building blocks for the machine learning APIs. So these are pre-trained models that Google have built over many years, trained with many examples, and we offer to you to you as a service. So these are core ones, and, and they kind of address common tasks like image recognition, uh, speech analysis, um, you know, video video analysis. So think of the scenario where maybe you already built an application or you have a service that you offer and you want to enhance it by adding machine learning, but maybe you don't have the data scientist, the expertise to do that. Uh, these will be the tools that you plug into. Um, you call them as REST APIs, and we'll look at some of what the calls look like in a second, but these are the services you would call 
pass them an input and you get some logical output. If I pass an image to Cloud Vision, then I get some inference about what that image is, and then you decide how you surface that in your application. So let's focus. The running theme was image recognition and natural language processing, so let's stick with those um, for kind of further detail. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see the sort of applications that you can apply to Vision API. So as I say, it's, it's pre-trained to recognize common objects, common lands, uh, landmarks, um, <coughs> good for kind of optical character recognition, web detection, and so on. Um, so if you think about your business um, and where you might want to apply these, these uh, you know, this, to this sort of problem, then you can see a few examples here. What would a call look like? So if I was to call these APIs, and we'll do a little demo shortly, but you can see it's pretty straightforward. So you need to give it a path to an image, and this will typically be in a Google Cloud Storage bucket. Um, and then you just tell it what, you, what, what entities you want to extract from it. So in this case, we're just doing label detection and text detection. So um, if we want it to identify what it finds in there. Maybe it's a cat, maybe it's a dog. Um, and perhaps if I was taking a picture of that sign over there or a newspaper, maybe I'd want to do OCR and extract the, ta the text. And then I'm saying I want to limit the results that come back to 10. You know, I don't want a huge JSON string to come back. And that's pretty much straightforward in terms of how you use it. And you could see how you might integrate this code with your application. Um, if you were to build it out in Python, again, there's very little code required. Um, it's a case of uh, importing the Google Cloud and Vision libraries, um, creating an instance of a client, which is authenticated to Google Cloud, um, and then passing it as an argument, um, the image uh, that we want to do label detection on. So you can start to see that there's not actually a whole lot of code required to get image recognition in your application. You can integrate this in a few minutes. So let me show you a quick demo of what this looks like. <coughs> so we have an instance of the API running on cloud.google.com. Um, of course, it's a great source of information. You want to find out more about our products and some of the things I've spoken about tonight, you can have a look. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to click here, and earlier, before before you guys sat down, I took a, an image uh, from the web of the Yankee Stadium. So let's see how good it actually is. So we'll open that up, and we'll look at the analysis. So it's gone off. So it's passed the image as an input, and it's saying return everything. So that's pretty cool. So it's already figured out that it is the Yankee Stadium, because it has landmark detection built in. Um, let's see what else it found. So in, in addition to identifying landmarks, it will it will give me it'll tell me what the landmark is. It will give me a longitude and latitude, which could be quite cool for integration with the application. Um, so what about the labels? So it has the probabilities and the labels I found. So it's definitely a sports venue. It's a baseball park. You can use these labels to certain surface these insights in your applications. <coughs> um, what entities it found, and it will provide you with like Wikipedia links or built-in searches, so you could reduce the time that someone has to, use to, has to do to kind of do a custom query on an image. It's found these links already for me. Um, it also detected text. Now, because it was an image and it's quite, I guess the image and the signs and the jumbotron are quite small, but it has had a go at trying to identify the text in there, but nothing really that discernible. <laughs> Let's look at the key properties. Um, dominant colors um, and, and themes. So a customer of mine, um, they run a project, uh, a CPG company, and what they really wanted to figure out was, you know, when we push an image uh, or we're promoting an image on Instagram, uh, what makes people like it? Um, you know, what, how, do you, how do you define something that's mouth-watering? So they pulled lots of images from Instagram and lots of tweets and the related text of the Instagram posts. Um, and did sentiment analysis and then built it out, okay, these are the positive comments about our products. And then they did some research around um, using Vision API, what were the dominant colors, what were the dominant themes, and then they can like, use that to tune how they're pushing out images, understanding what are the key themes, key labels that make people think their product is mouth-watering. So you can start to see how you can use the rich metadata that, you, that, that comes back from this. Um, also can use it for identifying adult content. So we can see here that obviously all the things that we're looking for are very unlikely. 
and then finally I just show you what the, the raw JSON might be a bit small but you can see the raw JSON that comes back um, all those entities have been surfaced in these tabs so hopefully that gives you a nice idea of, of how the, the standard Vision API works So let's move to natural language. So this is more about analyzing text that we've already extracted. So maybe I want to depend, detect sentiment, or maybe I want to classify a document in a certain way. Um, you can use natural language processing for that. Oh. And, and again, similarly, so now we're showing a call to the natural language API using Node.js. Again, it's fairly straightforward, calling the library, um, defining uh, a client call, defining what text we're going to pass to it, and then um, just making a simple call to the API, um, embedding the, the text object to the parameter, um, and then analyzing the results that come back. It's going to return a, a, a JSON that you can kind of parse in as an array, and you can look at those results and decide to surface them how you want. So again, we can also see that one in action. So let's say we just got some example text here that just some generic text about Google. If I click on analyze, you can see they've actually surfaced it quite nicely, but you can see from that passage of text it's pulled out an organization, it's pulled out a place, it's pulled out products. And you can start to see how you could use this to analyze and tag content that you already have. So not only has it broken out the entities in that piece of text, it's also told me what's the sentiment here as well. So um, for each passage, and you can see the score range here, so you can say that something below zero is probably negative sentiment, um, uh, or, or well below 0 0.25, 0 0.25 to minus 0.25 to 0.25 is probably neutral, and then if it's greater than 0.25 uh, to, to a score of one, then it's probably positive. Um, so you can see some of the scores that it's come up with there and to the magnitude to which it thinks. You can look at syntax analysis as well. So this is quite a nice visualization of the results that come back. So you can look at dependencies, is it a part of speech, the morphology, um, and also kind of key categories that it found. <coughs> so you can see the level of confidence that it's pretty confident that it was talking, that passage of text was talking about computers and consumer electronics and that kind of thing. goes by the evolution of one sentence? Each sentence just all this data? Uh, so it, it goes by each request <coughs> to the API. So the, the whole passage, the whole passage, the, the whole passage that you said. So those APIs are great for the general purpose, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, and so on. But what if you need something um, more complex? You want a customized model that's based on your data. That's where AutoML comes in. Um, so how it works is you supply label training data. So it might be images in the product catalog. It might be a specific syntax or terminology. Um, or way of translating from one term to another. It might be your specific vernacular for a certain subject domain, maybe financial services has certain jargon that's relevant to that industry. So you would pass that as label training data to AutoML. Um, then AutoML is basically machine learning, training machine learning. It goes away, optimizes and builds a model for you, um, and then serves you up with an endpoint. Uh, the nice thing about it is, is you don't have to write a line of code, you're getting a very custom model and you're also not having to worry about, you know, how do you serve that model as well? You have a REST endpoint available that's kind of a specialization um, of the standard APIs. So a good example is, you know, maybe, and here's our example use case, we want to predict um, weather trends um, and flight plans using clouds of images. So does the image, you know, do the clouds that I see in the sky determine if I'm going to, you know, divert an aircraft or do something different. So, imagine that I'm a meteorologist. Um, can we use the cloud to analyze clouds? <laughs> 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 yeah. 
So, so the challenge is there are many different types of clouds. Um, and depending on the type of cloud, if it's low lying, it's going to be fog. If it's you know those big cumulus clouds, maybe it's going to indicate rain, uh, and so on. But you know, how do we identify them in an easy and accurate way that's and it doesn't require a human there to like uh, examine some data? Um, okay, so if we applied some images of a cloud to the General Vision API, it's pretty good. You know, it's figured out that you know both of them are images of a scout of the sky. They both contain clouds. It's probably the day. It's atmospheric, but it doesn't tell me what type of cloud it is. So it's not going to help our use case in terms of determining what you know how we should route an aeroplane or how we should figure out you know what flight path to take. So I'm going to show you. I didn't trust the demo gods because we already had a problem earlier today. But I'm going to show you a short video, and I'll narrate it as it goes along. It kind of describes how AutoML works. Okay, so in this case, the data set isn't clouds, it's leaves. And you can see here in the AutoML Vision tool, the different categories of labeled leaf types that we've supplied it. Uh, and you guys could use this right now. It's available in beta. So in the train section, so we can look at our images. In the train section, we have the ability to look at previous iterations of trainings that we've run. And we can also see for each one what was the precision, the recall, we can also see a confusion matrix to see, you know, what, what was the accuracy or false positives that were identified for each training iteration. So you can quite easily see, you know, where, where were the ones where it had difficulty. Maybe we want to supply more instances of a particular leaf. And then you can test it. Uh, in real time on a particular image. So you can test it with an image that you upload from your computer, or you can test it as the rest of the API that it produces an output. And then we're just going to pass it two images of leaves. That will go away. If you're running the model for the first time, sometimes it takes a little while to warm up. But it's come back uh, with predictions for the leaf type and the probability that it's that type of leaf. So you can start to see the power of. Um, AutoML for vision. It's also showing us examples of how we'd call it from, from the REST API or from a curl command as well. And it's all that's pre built for you as well. All you need to do is use that path, tell it which model to use because you may have a number of different models. Uh, and that's essentially how it works. But if I want to uh, classify uh, according to the leaf structure and color, uh, if the plant was uh, growing in a hot place or a cold place, mm -hmm. can I uh, uh, train <coughs> the, um, the machine learning uh, model uh, according to some, giving results to some of the data and then get expected results to the other section of the data, the not training data, the other, the rest of the data? I'm not sure if I understand the question, uh, but if let's you... say that they have something which is more generic, like uh, classifying something by vision, but yeah. giving other results, not uh, the existence of an object, mm -hmm. but I'm giving only leaf's pictures, and I want to know, according to the leaf, where it was grown. But, but, and oh, I give results to some data sets, and I want to get results mm -hmm. to the rest of the data set. Okay. Is it possible? So if I wanted to do that, I might just use a standard vision API, maybe if I wanted to figure out other things about the object. Remember that the purpose of AutoML is to have more specific models specific to a data set. So if within this data set I had also leaves in a hot climate, leaves in a, cl in a cold climate, you, you would also get a result with a probability for those attributes. So it depends, right? It is a trade-off between having quite a customized model and something really generic. If I want something generic, I would try a Vision API first. If I want something more complex, then I start training it on the labels that make, make sense and they're important to me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> How many example images do you need for each label? Minimum 100 to get anything sensible. 100 for 100? each uh, label? For each label. And, and there's no real minimum. It's just like to get something sensible. Like the, the yeah, API I, creates the label right when it sees it. Yeah, I'd say 
a bare minimum you need at least 100 images and that's the biggest pain of machine learning is gathering the training data but if you give it 10 images it's going to be pretty rubbish it's not going to be very accurate so i'd say yeah minimum of 100 and then and it's upwards. open to the public now the data say again it's yeah. open to public yes the it data? is yeah yeah it's available now uh, to try uh, we'll take a look at the natural language processing next i think there's one more question we'll take we'll take the rest offline yeah so only vision and no, so vision, natural language processing, and translation are available in our terminal. I'll show the natural language processing next, um, but they're all available. So if you want to train on a specific um, <coughs> syntax or, or certain tagging or taxonomy, you can do that. If you want to translate in a more custom kind of way that's not maybe a standard language, um, you can do that as well. So does it support multi-label in an image? If I have several images, if I have one image with several objects in it, and I want to tag all of the different objects in the same image. So if it if it thought it was a, so it's no so that's a different slightly different use case. If you supply it with a leaf and it thought it looked like a couple of them, it'll say I think it was this this and this and here's a probability. Multiple object detection is slightly different. Um, and there is support in Vision API to do that today, um, but then it's still generic. I'm sure it's on the roadmap to do that, um, but not quite for the custom model yet. Not in automated. Not yet. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I'll continue. Happy to take questions after, by the way, guys. <coughs> okay. So who's using it in production? So a lot of the most common use case that I've seen for AutoML Vision at least is uh, retailers or people that are selling something. <coughs> so maybe I have a product catalog and I want people to be able to take a picture of something and relate that back to something that I have. So maybe I'm out on the street and I see some guy is wearing a cool jacket and I want to know where he bought it from. I could take a picture, maybe it belongs to Urban Outfitters catalog for example. But that's where I'm seeing the most common use case. You can see the Disney use it to understand, um, uh, you know, what are dominant colors, um, you know, what are the categories to, to kind of tag those images. Sometimes people just use it to accelerate the process of maybe building a realty listing. So I know another customer used AutoML Vision uh, to take pictures when when the realtor went around to the property, took pictures of the place. They pre-trained it with common objects like, uh, you know, kitchen island or a you know, oven hood or something like that. Um, and then they were passing those images to AutoML, getting the labels from that, and it was drastically reducing the time to build up listing then on the Realtors website. So a few use cases um, that you can kind of think about. Nice way to get custom image recognition without hiring a data scientist. So, Vision is great for image classification, but what if you've got other problems? Um, you want to classify text like we talked about. Uh, you can use AutoML for natural language. So maybe, I mean, here's some common use cases. So maybe you want to use it to, to predict the tags of a Stack Overflow question, or predict the source of a news headline, or maybe uh, conditions associated with maybe uh, a, a patient symptoms. These could be all custom um, custom vernacular to predict tags. It could be a custom taxonomy for a newspaper that's trying to figure, figure out, you know, how to tag a news headline, or perhaps um, quite specific vernacular for patient symptoms. So you can use AutoML and uh, natural language processing to to kind of facilitate this sort of custom problem. And here's some examples. Um, so looking at that piece of text. Looking at that, because I've done a bit of programming, I know that looks like JavaScript. Um, so you could infer from that, you could create a tag for, um, that it's JavaScript. And you can see from the description below that it is JavaScript code. But if you didn't see that bottom passage, auto and natural language could be a useful way of tagging that post. So similarly for um, maybe tagging the origin of a, of a headline, you build out a taxonomy of maybe popular headlines and the related newspaper, you could use uh, AutoML natural language to tag it, tag the source. And then 
equally, this is, this uh, this reminds me a little bit of expert systems that where you had to kind of build rules around if a symptom is this, that, and the other, then it's likely to be this disease. But without what this allows you to do is not have to kind of codify those specific rules. Once you kind of train it with what it would be the flu or influenza, you can then use variations of that uh, text, and it would still use machine learning to identify that it was indeed influenza. <coughs> So, I have another video to show you now. Uh, similar to the automobile demo, um, how you go about training, running predictions. So, in a similar fashion to the vision, vision automobile, we have different labels and text related to those labels. So, it's not too onerous to build a training data set. You can see here different instances, all the text, and then you can see the number of examples we've got for each label. And then equally, I've got a test bed that I can apply the model to. So you can just paste in some text to see how well the model will identify the text. <coughs> and then you can see it will return the probability that it's a particular label. And you can see here, for the other label types, it's given a lower probability. So you probably, maybe you have some logic in your application to say only return or only use the label return with the highest probability and then you can see um, back then there was also like an endpoint as well so what the code would look like to, to, to call that how many um, depends depends how many you need how many labels would satisfy your use case I've for examples oh for examples um, that's a good question I think the more labels you have, the more accurate the prediction will be, but I'm not sure exactly. We can check. I think the beta is... I think the beta is English, but I'd have to check. Um, and the final one is Automobile Translate. So this is where you've got domain-specific translations, not, not languages, because we've already got um, the Translate API for that, which covers a good range of languages. But if you would have specific domains where you want to apply knowledge, this is where you'd use it. So take, for example, the driver is not working. That could mean a lot of things wrong. Depends on the content. <laughs> <laughs> Test, test. No, no, no. We can hear you well enough anyway. Okay, I'll shout. I'll shout. <laughs> <laughs> um, our audio guy, this is, this is gone as well. No, no, it's okay. On the table. Oh. Bye. Can I check some different sound? Okay, we'll continue without the mic. Uh, people at the back, can you hear me? Perfect. So Take this passage here, the driver is not working. That could mean a variety of different things, right? It all depends on the context. It could be maybe the guy driving the car isn't working, but uh, what does it mean? So how can we apply automatic translate to this sort of problem? And this is kind of going back to what I was saying. It could be the driver on my golf club isn't working, the taxi driver isn't working, but maybe I want to figure out there's actually the driver on my computer that isn't working. So how can you use text and context and train data to kind of understand what is the context? This is our actual problem that we're trying to figure out, that <coughs> the driver for this particular piece of uh, this device isn't working. And we need to be able to translate that into an answer. Move to a Mac. Say again? Move to a Mac. Move to a Mac. <laughs> no driver. Move to Linux. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Um, 
So that, this is how we do it. So unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a video of Automal Translate tonight. I think at the demo working, unfortunately. Um, but that's the, the case where you'd use it. I've seen customers in financial services use Automal Translate to extract meaning from uh, articles in financial news feeds. So maybe someone in the industry would understand what, would, what a particular um, message about a stock ticker or movement of a stock might be, but you know the guy in the street maybe doesn't know what it means, and that's what they used it for. That was actually Nikkei, the Nikkei index. Um, and here are some other customer examples of where they're using um, Automata Translate. You might, I'm not sure if some of these businesses are in Israel or not, but um, Open Table. So Open Table really well on service for making restaurant reservations. Um, they they use this wheel of service to translate from English to German. Uh, for reviews and descriptions. But sometimes when you translate a language from one to another, you, some stuff is lost <coughs> in translation, right? Um, similarly for, for, for Blackboard users as well. Um, so you can see some of the sort of use cases where you can use AutoML. So, so far we've covered the building blocks of AI, which is the kind of the bog standard pre-built services for you know, image recognition, translation, and so on. We've looked at ways that you can customize those models on Google Cloud. And the final piece is Maybe you've got a really custom task and you want a bit more control over all elements of that, and maybe you've got the data science expertise. Um, what do you do next? So that's where CloudML Engine comes in. So CloudML Engine is a fully managed service uh, for training uh, TensorFlow, XGBoost, and Scikit-Learn models. Um, the idea is, and I'll show you what the interface looks like in a minute. Um, the idea is that you might do some local training and then you want to scale it up and use the power of the cloud to serve up predictions um, or do training faster. I mean, one of the biggest challenges if you guys try to do machine learning and training is it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of computational resources, and not everybody has got a huge rig at home that they can use to train this. So we offer our infrastructure in Cardinal Engine. Um, but the idea is that you don't have to provision any of those machines, you're just passing it um, labeled training data, or rather the training data and the model file it'll do the rest. So as I say, it's fully managed. Um, you, as an input, you tell it where the training data is, evaluation data is, um, you pass it a model file, uh, and then declaratively you can say what infrastructure you require. So do I want a medium instance? Do I want X number of workers? I want GPUs or TPUs? So if you guys aren't familiar, uh, when I'm training a machine learning model, it requires a lot of CPU, a lot of computational resource. Uh, so to address that, people started using GPUs, uh, graphics processing units, because they're quite good at handling the mathematical calculations that come part and parcel of training a machine learning model. At Google, we found that that wasn't really enough for us. Um, I'll give you an example. So Jeff Dean is our machine learning guru at, um, at Google. And he went away and did the math, and he figured that if everyone spoke to Google Assistant for three minutes, we'd, we'd exhaust all the computational resources in all Google data centers across the world. So we had to figure out you know, a way around this, and so we developed TPUs, so they're TensorFlow processing units. Um, if you compare the performance like for like with the GPU, it's like fast forwarding seven years. Um, and they're very well suited um, to the use case where I'm training or serving a prediction on a TensorFlow model. So we make that infrastructure available to you. You can't go out and buy a TPU off the shelf, but you can use it on Google Cloud if you want. Uh, and then I say we support TensorFlow, um, and Scikit-Learn and XGBoost so are very popular machine learning um, frameworks in, in the machine learning uh, community. Um, you can do batch predictions, you can also do uh, an online prediction as well. So it depends on the use case, maybe you want to enrich your data set uh, with a set of predictions. Maybe I want a real-time prediction because my application or my service is a website and I want to pull up some recommendations for a user really, really quickly. Take for example, my, my Netflix or you know, Amazon, you know, if you watch this movie, you might like this. And where are we seeing it used in production? Um, so, Ocado is one that I'm probably more familiar with. So, they built a model, um, uh, trained their prediction on, on the ML engine. What they wanted to do is distinguish between um, social media comments where a customer might be saying, okay, brilliant, my, my delivery came on time, awesome. 
but then maybe there was another tweet saying, look, the, the carrots that arrived yesterday were rotten. So they really wanted to be able to distinguish between those two elements, negative ones and things that they could be, might be less important, and then triage those um, in the customer support centre, uh, might be emails, might be social media, so the agents could determine, you know, which ones do we give most attention to, which ones do we address first. And then the one with Wells Voice I'm less familiar with, but they're using it to kind of track um, objects that may come, they may come across at sea, so maybe a lighthouse or maybe a um, uh, rocks or something like that. So I'm going to show you the UI. Now in terms of a demo there's not really much to show. Um, you use the command line interface to call a model, you pass it the parameters of where the training data is, and the configuration file and it goes off and does the magic. But let me show you a little bit what it looks like. So this is Cloud Platform, um, the console. Within there you, you, you use this navigation menu to, to find the ML engine. And then in there you've got two constructs, would be jobs and models. So jobs are just when you want to run training um, on the ML engine. Um, you might then take that model and use it elsewhere. So here I've got some previous jobs. It tells me if it was a success or if it failed, the current status, and we automatically track the loggings within GCP as well. So you can see how long it took, and then anything, any problems. In the case of an error, it will tell me what went wrong with the training job as well. If I click on the training job itself, amongst other things, because it's not running, I can't see how much CPU or memory it's utilizing, because this is a kind of after the fact. Um, but it will give me that data at runtime. And then what you can see here is the parameters that I passed. So the first block of code is actually coming from the configuration file. So in this instance, I said um, I didn't define anything <coughs> other than the scale tier. So if you go to cloud.google.com, you can see some of the different scale tiers. Um, and this scale tier was I just want a basic GPU instance. Uh, it might be the case that I just want to test it on a smaller instance, but the nice thing is here I'm just defining a pre-configured environment uh, depending on my needs. Then you can see if there's any dependencies or, or there's a model to point to, you can see that. And then you can see the other arguments below here as well. So which module contains the job that I want to run, where's the training and evaluation files, and then why do I want to run it? Um, so you can choose different regions in Google Cloud, depending on the data center location, um, what version of TensorFlow I want to run, um, and then where to store the metadata uh, for the job. And then what you also get then is once it's a success, you can see how many ML units it was consumed, and that relates to the cost on GCP. So the other thing you get as well is, so I might just want to run a training model, but then if I'm going to serve up models for prediction on a regular basis, then what I have is some light touch model management within GCP as well. So here I can see the different model names and the different version numbers, and I can apply labels to them as well if it makes sense. Um, if I take this example here, I could have multiple different versions of a model, and I could call them independently if I needed to from the command line. And then if I drill down into it, it gives me some metadata about the model. So in this case, I can see where the model is saved in Google Cloud Storage. Um, I can see what framework it was. So this isn't a TensorFlow model. This was um, a version of model using Scikit-learn, the framework version of Scikit-learn, the runtime version of TensorFlow. And actually, I used a really small instance to train that particular model, just a single core CPU, but I just wanted to test it out. And then you're able to kind of call these models um, for prediction in batch um, or online. I could encapsulate a call to one of these models using the tool called Cloud Functions. So it's another cool Cloud tool. Um, it's basically function as a service. So think of the highest level of abstraction in the compute stack, where I just want to define a lightweight function and call it from a web hook. So that's one way I could start serving up this model. So, <clears throat> so, 
Okay, quick as what? Well. So, question. Yes. Uh, so, for example, if I have a, a, a model which today I'm training for a long time uh, on a single machine uh, with TensorFlow and Kera, for example, uh, how could I switch to, to, to this ML engine? It's a good I, question. Yeah. So, why? Why should you? Alright, okay. So, so why? <laughs> that's, that's fine. It's a good question, right? So why, why do we in the cloud? So when I started the, 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 the talk, I was saying that you know, why are people moving to the cloud? Um, because they can tap into vast amounts of computation and vast amount, the place to kind of store vast amounts of data. Uh, you need those two things to train machine learning models at scale and do it quickly. So the why is because he's, doing, he's running on his laptop and it's taking him a day. It's taking him hours to train a model. A month. A month. Okay. So think about that. If he wants to change one parameter in his model, he has to wait a whole month to do the evaluation. That's crazy, right? So the why is because you want to scale up your training. You want to reduce that time to insight so you can iterate quicker. If you can iterate quicker, you can fail faster with your product. But they collect the cost of something that will shorten the lifespan, raise it like, by much. It right. sounds like, again, for everything that you will use, even if you like wrap up some kind of distributed framework that does that, it's servers. Somebody runs these servers. But so it's now built, built for a single machine, and you show like it's magic, like it's spreading. Nothing is magic. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm asking. Where is the... Well, well, it is magic in the sense that if you built a machine learning model in TensorFlow, and it all works, that it will handle the magic of the DevOps. Then you can say, give me 10 workers, declaratively, right? Infrastructure as code. And it will do that for you, as long as your model works and, and makes sense, right? And that will drastically reduce the training time. So the why is you want to reduce time. How you do it, um, it has to conform to a certain standard. So there may be instances when you don't use CloudML engine. So there are limits to the size of the model today. It expects the model to be in a certain format, so PKL or MDL format. Um, and you would have to upload your training data to cloud storage. So as long as you can conform to a certain folder structure and ways of doing things, it can be very good for you. The alternative is, if you want more flexibility, we've just, we've just launched what we call a deep learning VM. That's available on our marketplace. Let me show you quickly. Now that is pre-configured. So the biggest hassle, with no one I'm spinning up an instance, the biggest pain is defining all the drivers for the GPUs <coughs> and making sure that stuff works, right? Mm -hmm. That can take a lot of time. And I'm no expert in like Linux commands. You have to be a pro to get NVIDIA drivers set up. So this within Google Cloud Platform, this is called the Marketplace. And here we have basically instances of different technologies that you can deploy with one click. So maybe I want a MongoDB instance or maybe SAP Hammer or something like that. But deep learning VM is pre-configured with everything you need to start doing machine learning, deep learning. You would define um, you know, where you want it to run. Different regions have different restrictions. But here I can say, right, and maybe I need four GPUs, four Tesla V100s, for example. I pick the framework, depending on what I'm using. So maybe I want to use CUDA 9 or I want to use something that's more bleeding edge. And then I take this option here to install the drivers. When I kick that off, everything is pre-configured. And then all you do would be SSH into the VM that it creates, and then pull your code from GitHub or from your repo, or you could even just push it to cloud storage and run it from there. So the why is because you want to spend less time training, so you can iterate the model more quickly, get insights quicker. The how is the documentation on cloudofgoogle.com will tell you what you need to conform to for CloudML. This is probably a, a nicer transition for folks that are doing stuff locally because when you search into a machine, it'll look like a Linux machine, so it might be more familiar with what you know today. But the beauty is it's pre-configured to accelerate um, TensorFlow on a GPU. And it attaches the GPUs and it does all of the hustle for you. Exactly. That's the main Exactly. Uh, just from cost perspective, if you just take a machine install the TensorFlow library which is a you know a free uh, tool. Yeah, it's open and source, right? 
Yeah. In, so, in cost perspective, you, you take the right machine and the, the, that, that you need for the for that job to be the same as using a, 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 a Google model. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, because I think that that the, the machine learning of Google, is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you are charging. Please, I hope you got charging for not only for the machine uh, 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 size and time, but also for the transaction process. Is that correct? It depends, right? When it, if I'm doing, if I'm running a deep learning VM, all you're paying for is for the time that that VM is up and running. Mm -hmm. That's it. No, it's for the same as in uh, you described in the first like option, but they did all of the DevOps for you. It's easier. For the APIs, you're just pulling from the amount of APIs, I think. Yeah, so, so it's not like you're for the machine's running. No. So, Cloud ML Engine is slightly different to the deep learning VM. While that VM is running, I'm paying for it. Cloud ML Engine is different, is I'm only paying when I call it. When I run a training job or when I run a prediction. So, horses for courses, depends on what you're trying to do. I'll take one more question because I've only got a few slides up and we can chat outside. One more question about okay. um, My question is about uh, the ML as a service when you send the image. And, uh, yeah. You have a constant model uh, there uh, and when uh, I consider if I would use this model or my own model, uh, we don't really know uh, what results does your model get. Uh, do you publish somewhere the, the results of your model? The, Evaluation in uh, uh, some kind of metrics and or uh, that data sets. Uh, not so much for the the, the, the standard ones, the, the, the machine learning building blocks, the standard Vision API. Mm -hmm. it, the only information you're going to get back is the data about the image. We don't really publish um, evaluations. I don't. Really, I can't really tell if uh, if I should use this model or I should uh, develop my own. You've got to test it and you have to see how well it addresses your use case. In some cases, just generic object detection is good enough. But if you are looking at more specific things, like the cloud, think about the clouds example. It was telling me it was a cloud, it was telling me it was a sky, and maybe it's a sunny day. But in my use case, it wasn't enough. I had to identify what type of cloud it was. So you'll know when you need to go custom and when you can use something that's pre trained. Okay, so let me, let me, let me come to my conclusion. So, if you, if you remember anything about my talk today, there's three key things. Number one, you can use our pre-trained APIs to accomplish and use machine learning with your standard apps uh, for really common tasks like natural language processing, translation, image analysis. Number two, you want to train custom model with your own data without having to write code, you're going to use AutoML. And the final one, for more custom tasks, maybe I'm in the situation like over here, I'm training locally, it's taking me forever. I want full control over the code and how the model's built. I want to know everything end to end. Uh, you're gonna, you can train and serve on ML Engine as a fully managed service. Can you go back one slide, please? Yeah. The second point. Hold on. Number two? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks. is going haywire today. Um, if you want to find out more, you can look at how we can share these slides with you as well. Um, really, the first point of call is uh, cloud at google.com. You'll find documentation there. For some of our tools, you'll find live examples there. Um, have a look at the Google Cloud Podcast. It's a great resource. Um, tensorflow.org, great place to kind of learn about how to build tensorflow models. A lot of the labs that they have there are also in Colab, so it's like a Jupyter notebook environment. So you can start playing around there with code without even spinning up any virtual machines or doing anything. Um, so have a look at those resources. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. I hope it was insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.